I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city the, on earth. Bop, bop, boom. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the most haunted city on earth. My name is Madison Timmons. And I'm Chris Susie. And we are back with another Q&A. So thank you guys for utilizing that Q&A button on TikTok. Uh, you make my life so much easier uh, from doing that. So I really appreciate it. And you guys always come through with the funnest, like... Uh, funnest. Funnest, or... Most fun. The most fun. <laughs> funnest the works. Funnest works. Sorry. We'll put that on I'm, a t-shirt. You know, it's been a long week, y'all. It is October. It is busy season, and my brain is like, like that, so... Yeah. It, yeah, we've been very busy, especially Madison. Yeah. So, uh, excuse me uh, when my brain does that. So, yep, uh, you guys always come out with really great questions, so... But uh, with that, JT, you have some announcements for yeah, us? Yeah, just a couple quick announcements. Um, all righty. The next episode, which will be the episode, uh, this Tuesday's episode, uh, is going to be with Josh Runyon, the security guard. I mentioned that last episode. Uh, we're very, very excited. He's the security guard that um, was, is in that TikTok w that went viral where all those creepy things were happening in that, uh, in that cemetery. It's really, really really uh freaky stuff um so that's this tuesday uh or you could become a para junkie right now and listen to it right now um and we have a merch store that drops on halloween woo -woo. uh we got some really really cool merch um i'll be posting that soon um or you can become a para junkie and take a look at it right now and <laughs> sorry um uh hey okay Madison and I are going to be up in Asheville uh, for our uh, one year wedding anniversary. But we are also going to be doing mobile podcasts uh, yes. for the Patreon. So, very, very, very excited uh, for that. We're doing what? Helen's Bridge? Yeah, we're doing Helen's Bridge, uh, which we have been to before and we had a oh, paranormal yeah. experience with that. So, we'll talk oh, about yeah. that in the mobile podcast. Well, well, actually. Yeah, should we talk about it now? It we can give like, a little teaser, sure. Give, yeah. Okay. I so, mean, because we're going to be mainly storytelling, like, you know, in the in the mobile podcast. We can talk about it in the mobile podcast, too, like, while we're there. But it is a, it's actually, like. It's kind of a weird story. It is weird. It, it, okay, go for it. Okay, so basically, um, for my 21st birthday, JT had uh, made me this drinking scavenger hunt. Um, so basically he had taken the story of Helen, um, and mapped it out. So I would have to go to different breweries and order a certain beer to get a clue as to where we were going to like solve, uh, Helen's like mystery, essentially. It was really fun. Very creative. He's a very creative man. Um, but yes, yeah, so the ending would be, we would end up at Helen's bridge, um, and I would be a little bit toasty, so it would be fun. Uh, ghost hunting while toasty. And so, yeah, JT was fine. But regardless, <laughs> um, so finding Helen's Bridge is actually a bit tricky because it's all the way up in the mountains. Um, you really kind of have to know where you're going to not miss the turn to head up to the bridge because it is like the sharpest right hand turn you could imagine on the side of a mountain to get up to the bridge. And so we were driving and we missed the turn. And right when we were about to miss the turn, we heard the loudest smack like on the top of our car. Now, mind you, we were driving my Volkswagen Beetle that has a soft top because it's a convertible. And it sounded like someone hit solid metal. Like yeah. it was that loud. It scared the bejesus out of me. Yeah. I almost wrecked. I yeah. almost wrecked the car. And so we were like, that's weird. Um, and we had been talking the whole way up. We're like, oh, we're going to hell. It's very yada, yada, yada. And we were driving into what looked like a neighborhood at this point. And we're like, oh, we missed that turn. And when we realized 
that where we heard the noise was the turn, almost like something was telling us like, hey, you gotta turn here. <laughs> we know that you wanna go see us, we're right here. It's like, Helen was like, come on, come on you freaky people, let's get it, <laughs> you yeah, know, so. <laughs> seriously, so we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk more about it, we'll talk more about it, um, you know, during the mobile podcast, but yeah, it's exactly what happened. That was, yeah. that was, that was yeah. crazy. All right, so we'll do that, and then we're gonna do, um, we're gonna do like one or two other uh, places, um, up there because Asheville's freaking haunted. Bro. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking about doing the, uh, uh, what is it? The Basilica or, yeah. and then you talked about the battery park in. There's all sorts of haunted There's stuff. There's plenty of haunted, even yeah. the Biltmore is haunted. Oh I mean, yeah. <laughs> Biltmore. Okay. Um, we have a new Instagram. Yes. What is it? It is the most haunted city on earth. What? What a weird name for our Instagram. I know, Why right? Why would you make it that? I know. Ugly. Oh, Madison. <laughs> All right, I guess. I must also, um, <laughs> a couple episodes back, I mentioned uh, uh, just leaving us some five-star reviews, and we got like a ton out uh, like after that. So thank you all so much for leaving us five-star reviews on uh, Spotify and Apple. We really appreciate it. If you haven't already, um, you know, they help out a lot. Uh, you know, people see that we're a five-star podcast, and we try to keep it five stars. So... Uh, let's go ahead and start with the Q and A. Yes, enough enough of us blathering. Blather, 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 blather. So. All right, here we go. Question number one: Ginger Millennial asks, "Info on the stone wall where the danger stairs are by River Street?" Question mark. I've heard that people died while building it and were just put into the wall. I love that you call it the danger stairs. Danger stairs. <laughs> Death stairs. Yes. yes. So, uh, unfortunately, that specific story of people dying while working on walls and being buried in them is kind of universal. Mm-hmm. You'll find it anywhere there are old walls. Um, the Midway <laughs> Cemetery famously has a wall where the people who worked on it died and they were buried right there in the wall. And numerous places around the world have that same story. Uh, there is no distinct uh, corroboration to that, but there's also nothing stating that it didn't happen either. But what you do have are entrances through that wall into the city under the ground where they used to uh, put a lot of commerce, but there are also holding pens for slaves. And we are pretty certain that certain slaves uh, died in that. And, and it certainly would make sense that they would not be given any proper burial. Um, and the ground was probably earthen, so it, it would make sense that they would probably die there because a lot of people don't realize that um, while some slave trade happened right there on River Street, it was actually Johnson Square, which you had mm-hmm. to go. They, so they would trek them under the city for about a block, and the the auction site would be on Johnson Square. So th- there is a lot of speculation as to the kinds of horrors and terrors that were happening at the time. And Savannah itself, the downtown area, they had these commerce tunnels. Because rather than trying to lift, if you've ever been (laughs) to River Street, River Street is below Bay Street, and Bay Street is the bluff that starts the city of Savannah. So in order to get large items up, you'd either have to take them up the very dangerous steps or, the or, danger steps. <laughs> or, or lift them by, you know, uh, pulley or something. Uh, but there were places where you could just drive it straight into the city and deliver them to the commerce that, that are all along. Um, I think it goes all the way up to Broughton street, uh, which is interesting because Savannah doesn't have a lot of basements, but the buildings that do have basements were a part of this trade route. So, um, the, that wall definitely has a lot of stories, and it runs the entire length of Factors Walk. It's not just at the danger yeah. stairs. Mm-hmm. And if you walk up and down that Factors Walk, you will actually see doorways that have been bricked up. Yep. You'll see the outline of the door. You'll see that they've been bricked up, and that gives you that indication that these would, would have been storage and or access points to get into the... Um, <coughs> greater Savannah commerce. Yes. Um, and it, it isn't to say that they would bury people in walls. It's very common it's for very people common. to <laughs> bury people in walls in Savannah all over the place. So At Colonial Park Cemetery is a whole wall where people people's houses. Them. Yeah, people's houses, <laughs> people's houses too. Houses. Yeah, it's, um, well, I don't know about all that. What you talking about? 
Oh yeah, people are buried yeah. in the walls of houses. Uh, the Foley house had one, but that was that's a fun story. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Mrs. Foley, you know. Uh, yeah, let's have a let's have a separate episode on that. Yeah, yeah I know we'll, that. We'll, we'll, yeah. yeah, but right. um, okay. also I do want to say it's not just those spirits that haunt that area. It's also the people who fall down the yeah, people who fall down the steps. I, yeah. And it was it's very serious how many people have have grievously harmed or died going down the steps. I have a yeah. great uncle who fell down those steps, cracked his skull open in the forties. What? And no, not the forties, fifties, no in the fifties. And he never recovered from that brain trauma. <sighs> he literally lived the rest of his life mm. in an institution because he couldn't really care for himself. Yeah. Wow. yeah, they're, they're, yeah. There's a reason why they're called the stone stairs of death. <laughs> stone so. stairs of death. They are yeah. dangerous steps. And, and there are a lot of bars on River Street. Oh, God. So negotiating dangerous steps with high hills and alcohol seems like a, a recipe for disaster. Wear sneakers. Wear sneakers. I, no matter how much you don't think it makes you look good, having both of your legs and casts look worse. <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. is true. Okay. Sorry. All righty. No, no, no. It's all good. Okay. Here we go. Um, it, enema. Nespis asks, what would an atheist use as protection if they have no faith in religion or protective items? Are they not likely to have a paranormal experience? That is an excellent question. That really Holy is. cow. So uh, we start with the fact that, yeah, you're probably less likely because spirits don't want to expend energy on somebody who will not reciprocate in some way. And if an atheist is... Uh, devoutly atheist they have uh, a structure by which they understand the universe and how it works um so it and it doesn't necessarily include (laughs) any supernatural activity uh but at the same time atheists do have faith Uh, their faith is in a structure of the universe that works uh without deities involved And that is a powerful faith because that requires neglecting an entire, uh, uh, the entire world's faith base and standing against it. An atheist can call upon the belief that none of it is real Hmm. as protection Mm -hmm. from these spirits. And those spirits cannot penetrate it if that faith is true. Having said that, I think a lot of atheists are idealistic atheists, but, but contain fears and things that are just left over from a lifetime of religious trauma. You know? So sometimes while you are an atheist by thought and deed, sometimes you still harbor certain faiths and fears that make you susceptible. So there is, uh, there's a wide range of, of ways to approach that question, mm-hmm. and it's a really good one. But I have known ghost hunters who carried weapons. Uh, I've known a ghost hunter carry a gun, which I do not in any way endorse. Don't do that. A ghost hunter carries a knife. I myself oftentimes will carry a knife, but I just like sharp and pointy things. Um, oftentimes our faith in those tools, the comfort you feel being armed or being, you know, if that's where you find your comfort, it does not have to be a religious icon. It does not have to be what it has to be is something that connects you to a sense of security and strength. And that will becomes apparent to a spirit. Yeah. Um, I have heard it multiple times that you can force a spirit down by just being very secure in your position and telling the spirit straight up, do not mess with me. And the spirit has to gauge whether it wants to, you know, <laughs> whether it yeah. wants mm-hmm. to, to uh, expend any energy on somebody who is resistant and possibly can do you harm. That's the other thing. You threaten a spirit that spirit has to gauge whether or not you have the ability to harm it because sure. it doesn't know. Maybe you do. Maybe you have some secret ghost gun. Maybe you have some secret, you know, uh, thing. Ghost knife. Ghost knife. <laughs> ghost knife. That's what we need to sell. The oh, ghost no. knife. Ghost hashtag, hashtag ghost knife. Ghost knife. <laughs> yeah. No, no. The, um, the thing yeah. that I think people forget when it comes to like prof- protective items especially is that it doesn't have to be crystals it doesn't have to be all sorts of stuff i can point out a rock i could pick up a rock in that parking lot out there and be like if i have enough conviction and say this rock is going to protect me that's a conviction it's really just a matter of you know saying like i'm protected 
It's like in believing truly that you are protected. Right. It can't be you're trying to fool yourself. Yeah. It is about what truly makes you feel protected. Uh, a lot of people use family items, mm-hmm. like something that their father, grandfather gave them, gifted them. I used to carry a, a Zippo lighter that my father gave me, and that made me feel so very protected. Um, it had no supernatural <laughs> abilities or anything, but my uh, my relationship with this item made me feel protected. And and it, that's all it takes. It takes this this notion of protection to protect you, but it has to be sincere. It has to be mm-hmm. real. It can't be manufactured. Just and in that same note, going into a, a you know a crystal shop and asking the person behind the desk, "Give me a crystal that'll protect me," and they hand you one and you buy it. That may not work because there, is, there are very intense exchanges between your protective items and your spiritual comprehension of what's going on. So um, note that like crystals, and I've always loved this story, crystals have forever been noted as potent against mm-hmm. spiritual or, or protectively spiritual or, or just good for your health. Long before we had any scientific tests that backed it up, mm-hmm. people were able to sense and understand. So there are properties of certain items that absolutely have uh, protective qualities to them. Um, but that does not mean that you yourself can just hang a crystal around your neck and assume it's going to do all the heavy lifting. You have to put into that crystal. You have to agree that this is truth. Um, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we buy things and we're like, oh, this will work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on it. <laughs> it is. It, it is very much so about intention. Like one of the protection things that I have for our house, like spiritually, is moss balls. They have no protective like uh, correspondences, but you know what? You can, you you can, can put it them. in. Yeah. You can make them protective yeah. if you want to. And so, um, but yeah, that, that's just an example of it. So Cool. All right. So on to the next question. Shades of Glitter 13 asks, can ghosts fart? Oh, Lord. Uh, (laughs) Why do some spirits smell? So uh, in the case of farting ghosts, um, uh, scarily enough, if you're smelling sulfur (laughs) when when, (laughs) when, when an entity's around, you're not smelling a fart necessarily. You are possibly in the presence of a demon. Uh, demons are oftentimes marked with a sulfurous smell. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, so that is one thing that, uh, yeah, if a ghost farts, maybe you're dealing with a demon. Uh, however, interestingly enough, if a person is associated with certain things, like you know, you'll always hear like, oh, I smell my grandmother's perfume. Um, well, if you had a gassy person <laughs> who, who passed away, their presence may very well be marked by that scent. Oh, boy. Uh, because, you know, Uncle Fred was a fart machine. And after he died, uh, every time I go by his you know, bedroom, I smell you know, the fart. So, yeah, it, it, it's a funny question, but it's, it's worth noting, yeah, you know what? Whatever perceptive uh, uh, tags to a person there were, oftentimes are the ones that stay and remain. Unfortunately, if you have somebody in your life or your, your experience that was particularly flatulent, then yeah, yeah, that might be <laughs> the very thing that recalls it. Uh, I, I, my, uh, my dog was a terrible farter. Uh, and my dog would literally like enter the room, fart, and leave the room. <laughs> and we're like, we just got drive by <laughs> <laughs> Our dog drive by farted us. And after he passed, there was more than one occasion where it's just like, Ranger? <laughs> <laughs> and and it, was, it was one of those things. And I, I, there was a good bit of time. And, you know, this might just be memory when, like, out of the corner of my eye, I would have, like, ranger walking by or something i'm like oh and it wasn't abnormal it didn't feel unnatural it was only after i realized he had passed that i was like oh was that my mind playing tricks on me or is ranger still running around the house when it could be a residual energy of ranger you know um but sometimes those smells aren't even associated necessarily with like a physical ghost it can be residual um like the 
Marshall House, for instance, they have a couple rooms there where, you know, the room smells like rotting flesh and things like that. But that's because it's a residual haunting from the amputations, from the infections, the medical procedures that happened in that building. It just leaves an impression. And sometimes those impressions smell horrible. So, yeah, you know, um, it's, um, DeSoto downtown has... Um do you know about the soldier who died in the air conditioning system? Was yes. Oh. No, no, no. So no, that no. happened like in 2006. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, really? Yeah, it was very recent. As a matter of fact, I was a part of a search party at one point no looking way. for this guy because he just disappeared. Nobody knew where he was. But um, the way they found him was a smell through the uh, air conditioning system. Um, and people still, you know, this is 16 years later, mm-hmm. will say every now and then they get a whiff of something really rancid oh wow and it's just like a, a passing like moment of oh and it's like that's really interesting because of what happened why was know? the soldier in the that is one of the great mysteries yeah. because no it's not, a mystery it's like a no one super know- mystery yes because it was literally he called for a ride his father was only a few blocks away came to pick him up and he was gone and where he was found was triple he had to go through three secure lock doors get into a cage, get into the actual air conditioning unit. He got hit by the fans of the air conditioner. And it was just like, how does that happen? Whoa. And so a lot of people were just like, I don't know. And it took us, I want to say it was like two weeks of searching. Like we were putting up posters and going to all the places and asking around. And sure enough, when they found him, everyone was baffled because it was like, well, a, how did nobody know? It's like, well, because the air conditioner is also kind of weirdly off to the side of the building. You know, it's, sure. it's, not, it's not even a place that people would normally go for even the most basic uh, maintenance. And, um, and yeah, when he was discovered, it was, it was a, a story that was like very like ripple effect because it seemed very personal. You know, it was, it, yeah. it, it was just like, oh, wow. was he murdered? <clears throat> you know, how did that happen? Because it just seemed so unlikely. A That's story. wild. Yeah. All right. Going on to the next one, uh, Kareen Denny. Hey, Kareen. Um, hi. In regards to your last Q&A about getting info from resulting in a binding contract, does that go for tarot card readings as well? No. Um, so the reason why I say no, and take this with a grain of salt, because there are certain situations where it can result in something like that, most of the time when you are doing a tarot card reading, you're just asking for advice, uh, suggestions, if you will. Because usually when you're doing um, a tarot card reading, you're calling in your ancestors or you're calling in your spirit guides or your uh, whatever team of um, celestial beings, essentially, that you're wanting advice from. You're asking for them to give you messages so that you can go about the right path. But they're never telling you, like, this is what you're going to do or this is what's going to happen. Everything is always going to be very uh, up in the air, essentially, because you still have free will. You can choose to not follow their advice and, you know, uh, go a different direction. Now, if you get messages through your tarot cards for some reason and it's saying, like, you are, you know, you're going to become wealthy on this date or something, then you're dealing with something else and that's where it gets messy. But it's not a, a contract necessarily because it's just asking advice of It's something. clarity. It, yeah. you're, you're looking for clarity. And it's, tarot's are, are fascinating because um, some decks designed and uh and and made with ill intent in mind Mm -hmm. um and some decks are you know and and you'll hear this often um only the person who deals with the deck should really touch it or spend time with it you know you don't want to hand your deck out to a bunch of people you don't want a lot of different influences on the deck but having said that what you're really doing is you're divining from symbols what where you are in the absolute present. So at the moment of the flipping of the cards, you're being told this is where you are and the paths that are available to you. Mm -hmm. Um, And so sometimes it is sold as, well, I see, you know, a a tall, dark stranger in your future, or I see these things. The truth of the matter is, it is about where you are in the moment. And with tarot cards, it is a, 
a type of divination, and uh, I am against most all divination, to be honest. Uh, but I know that it is about how far away from the spirit are you in the tool and using the tool. So it becomes a question of what is your goal? <laughs> and uh, and tarots are very interesting because they are uh, a lot of, it's, it's about, you know, a shuffling of a deck creates a random effect. And it is about the nature of the randomness of our existence. And the, the very idea that we have free will suggests that what the deck is really doing is trying to give you focus and focal points in your life. So when you flip a card that says your past, any one of those cards can be interpreted for your past and events of your past. So by flipping this card and saying, well, let's take a look at what just came up because it came up randomly and it absolutely addresses some condition in your life. Mm -hmm. And that is where I think the tarot really stands differently because oftentimes when you're dealing with psychics and mediums, they are, they are expressly speaking to a spirit that is conveying information directly, whereas the tarot is about an interpretation of symbols and, and things of that nature. So, yeah, um, I, I do have bad tarot stories, <laughs> absolutely, but it's all about the intent of the person w holding the deck. Absolutely. And so don't, don't let people handle your decks. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, don't let people touch any of your witchy items ever. Um, I honestly don't really trust people seeing my altar most of the time, or at least some of the things Absolutely. I'll put away. And, you know, um, it's, it's important to, you know, um, keep things personal to yourself because it does, it has your energy and it is a signature of you, essentially. Um, but I will say different tarot decks have different personalities and That's some will true. roast you more than others. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, well, they uh, will. I've, I've had terrible experiences with Aleister Crowley's Thoth deck. <laughs> be, be mindful of what the purpose behind each deck was. And Aleister Crowley created a deck that I, I believe was designed and, and, and manipulated to feed uh, a, a larger energy mm -hmm. and um and so and you can feel it you can you can touch it and taste it and say mm, this is it this is this is the one that needs to to go with me don't just pick up the the next one you know yeah. because there's so many there so are so many yeah and you know the 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 classic one i think is probably the most neutral of them all the the weight the the uh the weight yeah weight. Uh, yeah. yeah so um you know the, the classic one i think is the most neutral and you can also just use a regular deck of playing cards. Yes, you can. Um, you will miss out on a lot of the major arcana, <laughs> but a regular deck of playing cards kind of serves the same purpose. It does have a lot of the notations mm -hmm. and, uh, and things that you would, might understand to be um, spiritual communication. Yeah, that's actually how my grandmother used to read yeah. cards. Um, now in the, uh, and because those weren't made with that intent, they have less likelihood mm -hmm. of uh, of snowballing other spirits. Exactly. You know? Well, and you see, it's also, th this is a vessel of sorts, because especially if you're sensitive um, or you have a good connection with your spiritual team of sorts, uh, you pick up on other messages in your own head too. Like where, uh, you know, I, I know the sp specific voice of my spirit guides, you know, and I'm like, oh, that's them. Okay, cool. Picking up on like whatever it is that they're also trying to specifically say through the cards, you know, they're like, this points you in the direction. This is what we specifically mean. Things like that. So. All right. Good stuff. Next question comes from Aaron Bailey, 2002. Could a haunted vessel literally be anything? I'm 20 years old, and if I were if I were to die tomorrow, I would haunt my blankie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hashtag exiled me. Yes. Uh, hashtag Chris fangirl. Woo. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Uh, thank you for the attention. Yeah. <laughs> um, absolutely, anything. Absolutely, anything can be a vessel for a ghost. What you have to realize is that when you have an item. Uh, in the spirit world, the idea of the energy is like we're all underwater. The spiritual, spiritual energy is water, and that means it surrounds everything. It completely has anything physical is penetrating the spiritual realm, and any effort you put into an item 
takes away some of your energy. So yeah, anything that you uh, that you put love, concern, uh, uh, attention to, can become the vessel of uh, a spiritual connection, um, a haunted item, as it were. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, and I mean, there's all sorts of haunted objects in it the really world. Is. It really. Um, it depends on like the connection, like Chris mm-hmm. said, with your relationship with that item. Um, it can be a chair that was haunted, or like you That's know. Why ch- antique stores are so full of haunted items? Because really, what you're dealing is you're taking something that was sitting inside a specific energy and then moving it. And when you move it, it's taking a piece of that energy that it's soaked up for. 50, 100 years, and now it's in a new place, but it still has that energy, that original sure. energy that was all around it all the time. Mm-hmm. So, um, and not to say like, you know, ah, antique stores. Uh, it's to say yeah, that- Yeah, antique stores too. That's where, yeah. well, yeah. <laughs> that's where a lot of energy left over from lives. And these are, uh, I always talk about the fact that you can have conflicting energies. Uh, an item may not be evil. It just might have come from a house that had a different energy entirely than the house that you bring it into. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. this object that you brought home, this vase you brought home, it used to be in a house that had an entirely different ideology and an entirely different sensation and an entirely different way of existing. You bring it into your house, all of a sudden there's friction. And that supernatural friction might seem like, oh, it's evil. It's like, it's not evil. It just isn't jiving with the energy in your in your surroundings. Sure. So if she if she were to haunt her blankie, mm-hmm. uh, and let's say someone put that blankie over them, and it's someone who found her blankie, maybe someone that she did not like, maybe a bully, like, you know, uh, from, from younger years, and could she, if she's haunting the blankie, could she make it never warm the person could she make it fall off of them constantly possibly like yeah. nightmares yeah i mean it's possible it's very possible i mean depends on how strong of an entity she becomes you know that's true so yeah work out make sure that yeah you <laughs> work out your, your, yeah. your energy is strong so that you can you can do some blinky damage blinky damage blinky damage hashtag blinky damage <laughs> all right here we go uh badsy wifey uh asks what keeps a spirit bound to the earth? Why are so many spirits angry? Is there any way you can help them? Wow. That's three solid questions. Yes. Um, it's tricky uh, trying to determine what binds a spirit to the earth because it could be a number of different things. I mean, just burial practices in general. We've talked about, you know, just that concept of putting like this is where you're going to be um carve your name in stone exactly (laughs) this is where you are now that can bind things uh bind people to you know this earth sometimes um it can be a lot of times what's keeping them here is you know that unfinished business the um Sometimes they just don't want to go over and yeah, They're sometimes scared of it. Unfinished business is being alive. Exactly. You know, it doesn't have to be some like, I was murdered, must find the person who killed me. It's literally, I don't want to be dead. So my unfinished business is being alive. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, there, when it comes to like, why are some spirits so angry? I mean, if you were an angry person in life, a lot of times that follows you over. You don't just, your personality doesn't change because you're dead now, you know, you're still who you are. And, and if worth noting, we, the stories that are told are usually told about angry spirits. I, I believe that the vast majority of spirits are good-natured, mm-hmm. are perfectly welcoming, are perfectly, you know, content. Um, they're not angry. Uh, but they make for lousy stories. You know, <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants yeah. to be like, I woke up and there was a ghost at the end of my bed and it said hi. Good like, morning. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Uh, so in essence, we tell the bad stories because it's compelling and, we, uh, and, and, and we're suckers for a good ghost story that is yeah. you know, full of you know, angry spirits and murderous intent and, you know, oh no. Menace. Menace, <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, but the truth of the matter is the, that is the nature of human, you know, storytelling. We go for the sensational over the, um, the normal. You know, normal things 
in anything, in books, in movies, uh, you, you find less and less of the normal experiences and you find all these heightened experiences. And so we tell heightened stories more often than we tell normal encounters. Mm. You know, I, I have plenty of ghost stories that are literally just people coexisting in a house that is haunted. They don't, you know, there's, there's oh yeah, there's a ghost here. You know, um, and that doesn't really read when you're around a campfire going, and they were very content with each other. <laughs> you know, and the kids aren't like, oh no, they're content. So uh, yeah, I, I think the misnomer is, um, ghosts aren't all angry, but the stories we tell often are mm-hmm. <laughs> about ghosts that are angry. Yeah. So it just seems like there's more of them. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then for the question of how can we help them? So the average person is not going to usually be the one to help a spirit crossover because that is a deeply personal choice for a spirit to do. And in my opinion, it really takes a special type of person to be able to assist those type of spirits. Um, Like there are um, types of witches called death witches. That's their sole purpose, you know, of um, being is just helping people cross over. Like that is something they go through years and years and years of training and whatnot and studying and learning to assist people. And that's what their soul has been drawn to do. But, like, for the average person, I mean, like, you can ask them why they're here, and you can say, like, maybe do you see a light? Do you want to go over to the light? Yada, yada, yada. But that's, you know, that's not really usually going to help because if they're still here, there's usually a pretty deep reason. And, yeah, and we are not privy to those reasons. You know, Mm -hmm. even in the cases of people who really study and really try uh, to understand it, the ultimate thing is the spirit's here for their own hang-up. And... um, And what's interesting is uh, I I went on a deep dive for a long time interviewing people who either received exorcisms or witnessed exorcisms. And one of the interesting things that that they would talk about is that there was a length of period of time where everything was calm, but then it started up again. Mm. And I think that that kind of told me a lot about the nature of spirits. Like if you show up and you're like, you know, in the name of God, leave. And they're like, oh, oh yeah, okay, I, I, I will. But they don't know how. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they're just like trying not to make a noise. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, no, that guy said, in the name of God, leave, and I'm still here. <laughs> so, so they just kind of like, they mind their P's and Q's. But over yeah. time, they're like, what if I just did, you know, like just tap something? <laughs> nope, so good. And so, you know, yeah. the, the things return. It's not as easy as just willing it away or, or saying, look for the light because something specific to that spirit. And so I think one of the classic stories is find out why, yeah. you know, find, yeah, yeah. find the reason, but that's not always the answer, but it is compelling and does seem to be a part of filling out the puzzle for them. Cause the classic story as a matter of fact, the oldest written story is literally a ghost that walks around at a, a, a home and it, and it disappears when it walks over this one thing. And then when they dig where it disappeared, they found its body and gave it a proper burial. And then, Ooh. and that's the classic story. And that was told like, you know, 4 AD or something. You know, it was so long ago that somebody had decided to write down this story. Sure. And, it's, it, and it could have been written yesterday. <laughs> it could have been. Exactly. You know, um, and it, what the recognition was, was that the spirit was unsettled because its body did not receive a proper burial or the, uh, or the recognition of its death that we have grown to accept is the process of death. A process of death is the recognition and the acknowledgement of the person's life. Uh, we write their name in stone. We you know put them in the ground. We have a ceremony. We literally have this huge ritual that we perform for the dead. And people are, 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 it's so commonplace in our minds, but it is, that is a a magical ritual used to bind a spirit to either the afterlife where it needs to go away or to the stone so it doesn't come home. Oh, wow. You know, these are things like that. Yeah, that people kind of, we've taken it to be, uh, you know, uh, an act of remembrance, but it's truly an act of, passage hoping that the spirit will find its way to peace or to the next realm or at the very least not back home <laughs> you know not yeah. back wandering into the house and uh, and and to this day people still practice a lot of interesting and curious things around like funerals like 
covering mirrors in the home so the spirit doesn't get lost, doesn't wander into the mirror thinking that it's another room. All these things are activities that we do without thinking of its implication. It's like, well, it's tradition. Well, it's, you know, but it is rooted really heavily in the idea that we influence the spirits through our actions and through our rituals. Could, and, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Could you stop talking about the, the, the spirit and let him fade? That's the, the concept of starving yeah. a spirit. Yeah. You can starve a spirit. However, that only works if the spirit is not rambunctious. That is you true. Know, some, some, some spirits, when it gets hungry, become like anything. Yeah. <laughs> The more ravenous it becomes, the more dangerous it becomes. So, you know, some spirits will just know not to expend the energy. Sure. Because if it expends the energy and doesn't get energy in return, yeah. it'll fade entirely. If it expends the energy and you're like, ah, that's a lot of, you know, interaction. <laughs> and so, yeah, you could inspire a spirit to behave sure. as a hungry animal and, and, and into, you know, attacking for food. Um, but it's not a bad notion. It's yeah. definitely a good step in there if you're looking to, to uh, stop communications with a ghost. By not interacting, that spirit doesn't want to waste energy on somebody who will not return or reciprocate. So, uh, so it's, it's, it, 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 that is a, a, a good approach. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, here we go. Uh, Anne-Marie Morales asks... Ha! Me and my questions are back. <laughs> love it. Excellent. I love it. Yes. I'm glad you enjoy them. What is the difference between an empath, sensitive, and a medium? Great show, y'all. Mm. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so, uh, basically, I do want to start with just saying, like, uh, there are 10 different types of clairsenses. Um, and so, they all revolve around seeing, uh, hearing, feeling, knowing, um, you know, sensing energy, yada, yada, yada. And so the different types of psychics, if you will, tend to lean towards different types of clear senses. So like a empath leans heavily into being able to feel the emotions of another person. So these are people who, you know, can, they can always tell when you're upset, you know, like, or if you're, they're affected by other people's moods around them and things like that because they're constantly taking that energy from those people and it's affecting them. Uh, when you get into a sensitive, as people have started calling it, which is essentially just clairvoyant or clairaudient type people, people who can see spirits or hear spirits, they're the ones that are, you know, like, like myself who, you know, are like, oh, there's a ghost over there or like I can feel there's a presence here or something like that. A medium is essentially a person who sits in the middle between this realm and the spirit realm and they're able to take messages from spirits um, and they're kind of a vessel for the spirits to interact with this side essentially they're just born naturally a vessel and they have a tv sorts. show and a yankee accent oh lord oh, gosh i i don't even like to get into the like uh tv mediums and psychics and stuff it, it, that all started even in the 50s really just of people wanting to make a quick buck and i don't love that cause oh it, yeah even the late 1800s oh yeah was the, was the boom and it is interesting because um i always like the word medium because uh, it is also what we use when we talk about um, art. You know, what medium are you using to convey your message? And yeah. that is exactly what a medium is. A medium is the method that a spirit is using to communicate. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and so uh, that's a great way to, to, to remember it is that a medium is dealing with spirits that are communicating through the medium. Uh, that is their medium. Their medium is this person. Uh, and that gives you a, a, a clue about it because an empath, of course, uh, sensing uh, emotional situations oftentimes, you know, can be very overwhelmed when you take them to a place with sorrow or anger or, or you know, all these very specific things that help you guide you along. And uh, I find that sensitive is the use of the word sensitive is just a person who is aware and has um, the ability to discern whether or not a place 
has anything in it, but oftentimes they are, it's all patch mealed. It's, 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 yeah. it's, it, it's nothing that they can interpret or focus in on. It is something a little broader. Um, at least that's what I've come to learn sensitive t- tends to mean is that they are not tuned in uh, specifically by sight or, or, or sound or vision or, or empathy or any of those things that they are just uh, susceptible to the energies around them and, and are able to remark on them. Um, I myself am uh, a scaredy cat. Uh, I, I call it hypervigilance. I have hypervigilance. And hypervigilance means that when the temperature changes, I'm like, uh, when a sound happens, I'm like, ah. Um, and 90% of the time, it's, it's perfectly natural. But that 10% of the time that it's not natural, it, it, it helps. Uh, but I don't have what I would consider to be any of the um, the key elements to sensitivity. I just, I'm very aware of my surroundings. And, and technically, I'm very aware of threat. So I spend a lot of time assessing threat. And in that, I think, comes my, my and uh, if you watch any of our ghost hunts, you'll note that I'm hearing things, that I'm moving and stuff like that. But that's pure paranoia. You know, uh, so my superpower is paranoia. <laughs> so you could be an empath, a sensitive, a medium, or scaredy cat. Or scaredy cat, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. That's funny. Um, but yeah, it's um, sensitive has also just become such a catch-all term because mm. I th- feel like people are starting to lean away from the word psychic because it has such a negative connotation nowadays because people hear, like when you say like, oh, I'm a clairvoyant psychic or whatever, and people are like, oh, you're crazy, you know? Well, it's even the like, word psychic is so loaded. It yeah. is. You know, um, and, and, and not even bad, it's just there's so much to the, the concept of psychic abilities that um, and unfortunately, too many uh, too many mediums, meaning media, utilizes psychic as a catch-all for you know powers. Exactly, and it's like, well, no, <laughs> you know, nope. it, it, we need to, to to tone it down a little uh, because it is it, it's a fairly mundane definition of abilities that we cannot gauge normally through science, you know, uh, and, and, and dealing with the mind. Sure. Um, so that gives us, you know, a much, a much more sound, but the connotation of course has come through as, Oh, he's a psychic. He's reading my mind. You know, <laughs> well, I better think of kittens and puppies. <laughs> or he can see the future. Or he can see the future. The future. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh my God. Scary, scaries. Uh, uh, people who see the future are dealing with something a, a little beyond the spiritual realm. And we talk about this a lot. Mm-hmm. The, the future is supposed to be obscured from us for a reason. Sure. Uh, it is a part of the human experience not to know what comes next. That is essential in our development as spiritual beings is to experience things as they come so that we can live in the present. When we become addicted to the idea of the future or the things that might come and we go to people who are going to reveal it to us, oftentimes we are dealing with entities who have a notion and idea of this grand plan, which was not meant for us, which we are not meant to know. However, throughout history, there have been people who've been granted sight of the future and sight of things to come, which means that to them, they have a purpose, a profit, uh, you know, an idea of, of, of exposing, the, the, you know, exposing the future. Sure. But when we seek it out, uh, we are stepping out of our lane we're <laughs> we, we are meant to experience life uh progressively not you know skip over you know <laughs> yeah. moments all right i would love to end this episode with a creepy story that happened um uh over the weekend oh, and yeah. uh to claire one of our actors madison do you want to go ahead and and uh finish the episode off and tell this uh terrifying story that Claire told us and yeah. we even got it on tape a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was actually in the room when this happened. Um, but basically on, well, you, I guess it, it was a Friday uh, because you guys are going to be seeing this way past when it happened. But um, this past Friday over the weekend, we basically, um, I filled in as our host for the show. So we have a guide who basically leads the audience through the different scenes and yada, yada, yada. Um, So I was filling in for that. And so this 
we, uh, particular show, for some reason, um, in the Demon House scene, we have a moment where the light goes out. Um, the demon shuts the light off, and the room fills with darkness and all that. And the light went out a little early for some reason this night. So Claire was trying to gauge like exactly when she's supposed to get out of the bed. Now, she immediately... Like, she's in the darkness, and she feels two hands shake her three times. And she thought that it was Q, who was playing the demon, um, had come up and, like, grabbed her to be like, hey, you need to get going, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then she basically, on the video, you see her go like this, um, pretty much like, like, who just touched me? And after the show ended... Uh, she went up to Q and was like, hey, did you grab me? Like, did you, like, shake me? And he goes, no, when the lights went out, I was down there with Maddie, you know, like, I was in my place. And she was like, well, was it an audience member? Did somebody touch me? Like, that was really weird. Like, somebody shook me. Like, who was it? So they go to the cameras, because we have security cameras to be able to see when to fire the cues and whatnot, and they notice there's nobody touched her but it was right at the moment that she was supposed to get out of the bed that you know um that she was grabbed so it was almost like uh the spirits because the spirits we've been doing this for a while in the building at this point they kind of know the cues they know um when we're supposed to be wrapping things up or supposed to do things it was almost like hey you should uh get going your your cue's about to start so it was very interesting though but she was freaked out because she's she had never felt anything like that before she'd never felt a ghost literally grab and shake her so very interesting experience so the spirits of the cedar are getting friskier and friskier by the day i swear they are it's you know very interesting story nonetheless but with that though um we are going to go ahead and wrap things up. So if you don't already follow us on uh, TikTok, make sure to follow us under the Savannah Underground and go follow our new Instagram, the most haunted city on earth. Um, also, if you haven't considered becoming a para junkie on Patreon, definitely consider doing that. But with that, my name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And stay spooky, y'all. <laughs>